So here we're gonna look at what I think is a pretty nice approach to the Gaussian integral. So that is, we're going to show that the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus x squared is equal to root pi over two. And this approach comes from this book I have called Explorations in Calculus. I'll put some information on the screen right now about this book. We're gonna do that by developing four pretty simple tools and then making an inequality involving these tools, which is quite short at the end. So this first one is the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus x squared is the same thing as the square root of n times the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus n times x squared. So let's dive into this starting with the right hand side. So I'll take this square root of n times the integral from zero to infinity e to the minus, and I'm gonna write this as the square root of n times x, the whole thing squared, just to motivate our substitution. So now since we've got that radical n times x grouped together, that really motivates us to make a substitution where u is equal to the square root of n times x, that makes du equal to the square root of n dx. Okay, so that means when we make our substitution, all of this will become u, and then all of this that I'm underlining will be our du. So that's good to see. So we've got the integral from zero to infinity. Notice when x is equal to zero, u is also zero. And when x approaches infinity, u is also approaching infinity, and we have e to the minus u squared du. Now, we're essentially done, but maybe if you wanted to, you could do one more very trivial substitution, letting u equal x. That, that makes du equal to dx, and we have this is the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the minus x squared dx. So that means we've established this first tool. So now let's look at the second tool, which is a nice inequality. And we'll do this in two stages. First, by looking at the upper bound for e to the minus x squared, and then the lower bound. So let's start with the upper bound. So I'll take e to the x squared, not e to the minus x squared, but e to the x squared, and I'll expand it as a Taylor series. So the Taylor series for e to the x is well known, so that means the Taylor series for e to the x squared can be derived from that pretty easily. That gives us one plus x squared plus one over two factorial x squared squared, which is x to the fourth, plus one over three factorial x cubed squared, which is x to the sixth, and then so on and so forth. So our general term will be something like one over n factorial x to the two n. Next, I'll group the final infinitely many terms, all but the first two terms, and notice that all of these terms are non-negative. And we can see that because we have even powers of x. So they're zero if x is zero, but they're positive if x is non-zero. So that tells us that e to the x squared is bigger than or equal to one plus x squared because we just dropped a bunch of non-negative terms. Now we'll take the reciprocal of both sides of this inequality. That'll give us e to the minus x squared on the left-hand side. That'll give us one over one plus x squared on the right-hand side, and that'll switch the direction of the inequality. So that establishes this top end of our goal inequality. So now let's look at this bottom end. So, and we'll do that by considering the function which I'll call f of x, which is equal to e to the minus x squared plus x squared minus one. And now it's important to notice that this lower bound will hold if and only if this function is always non-negative. So I'll put that over here in yellow. Equivalently, we wanna show that f of x is bigger than or equal to zero. So let's maybe see how we can do that. Well, notice that it's an even function. So we only really need to show that this is bigger than or equal to zero for all x bigger than or equal to zero. So let's maybe test this out and notice that f of zero is equal to zero because we have e to the zero, which is one, plus zero minus one, so that's equal to zero. Next, we'll take the derivative. So f prime of x will be equal to minus two x e to the minus x squared plus two x. So that's just using the chain rule on that first term. 
So I can factor a minus 2x out of this. And that leaves me with e to the minus x squared minus 1. So if I set that equal to 0, I find the only place that this thing can change from being increasing to decreasing. But notice that this critical point occurs only at the point x equals 0. So in other words, this function can only change from being increasing to decreasing at x equals zero. Again, because this is an even function, all we really need to do is check what's happening to the right of zero. And so we'll do that with a test point. So here, we'll test this at x equals one. So at x equals one, we get f prime of one, which will be equal to minus two times e to the minus one minus one. Okay, but maybe we could move some things around here and see that this is the same thing as two times one minus one over e. But we know that e is 2.718-ish. So that means one over e is gonna be definitely less than one, making this thing most definitely bigger than zero. So we have f of x is increasing on our interval zero to infinity. Again, because it can only change from being increasing to decreasing at zero because that's our only critical point. So it's always increasing. It starts off at zero, which means it's always going to be bigger than or equal to zero. So now that most definitely works for all positive x, and then using the evenness of the function, you can argue it for all negative x as well, although that's not super important for us because our integral is just from zero to infinity. Okay, so we've established this full inequality. Now we're ready to calculate our two integrals. So let's look at this first one. We've got the limit as n goes to infinity of the square root of n times the integral from zero to one of one minus x squared to the n dx. So on the previous board, I had a one over radical n here, but I fixed it, so this is how it should be. Now, there's a number of ways to calculate this integral, but maybe the way that I wanna do it will be to do a trigonometric substitution and then use a well-known formula. So let's maybe set x equal to sine theta. That makes dx equal cosine theta d theta. One minus x squared will be equal to cosine squared because of the Pythagorean identity. Then when x is equal to zero, theta will be equal to zero. And when x is equal to one, theta will be pi over two because of the values of sine. So that allows us to rewrite our x integral as a theta integral. So here we'll have, this is the limit as n goes to infinity. We have the square root of n, and then the integral from zero to pi over two of cosine to the two n plus one theta d theta. We see that it's cosine to the two n plus one because we have cosine squared to the n and then an extra cosine from the dx. So at this point, we've actually arrived at a fairly well-known integral. It's sometimes called Wallace's integral. And so we're not gonna evaluate this. You can find an evaluation of this integral um, a bunch of places on YouTube. What we will do is just jump to the well-known value of this integral. So we have still this limit in action. This limit is n goes to infinity of the square root of n. And then next, we're going to have two times four times six, all the way up to two n in the numerator. So that rising product of even numbers. And in the denominator, we'll have one times three times five, all the way up to two n plus one. So a rising product of odd numbers in the denominator. Then this is actually a variant of the well-known product known as the Wallace product. So I've done some videos on variants of the Wallace product in the past, if you guys wanna check those out. But suffice it to say, this thing converges to exactly what we want, which is the square root of pi over two, meaning we've established our first integral property. Now we're ready to derive this formula for our second integral. This is pretty similar to the last one that we did. So again, we've got this limit as n goes to infinity of the square root of n, and then the integral from zero to infinity of one over x squared to the n. 
So this one is also screaming out to do some sort of trig substitution, but it's with another trig function. So here we'll let x equal tangent theta. That makes dx equal to secant squared theta, d theta. And that makes one plus x squared equal to secant squared theta as well. Next, when x is equal to zero, that makes theta equal to zero. And when x is approaching infinity, that makes theta approach pi over two. Again, those are from well-known values and limits of the tangent function. So that allows us to take our integral from the x world to the theta world. So here we have, this is the limit as n goes to infinity. We have the square root of n, the integral from zero to pi halves. So we have a secant squared theta on the top. And then in the denominator, we have a secant to the two n theta. Now next, we'll use the fact that secant is one over cosine to exchange this secant squared over secant to the two n with cosine to the two n minus two theta. But now we've got essentially the same sort of integral that we had before. It's another one of Wallace's integrals. So we won't evaluate this because you can find this on YouTube in a bunch of different places. So we'll just jump right to the evaluation of this integral, which gives us another nice product. So we'll have the limit as n goes to infinity. This square root of n is still out front. And then we have one times three times five, all the way up to two n minus three in the numerator. So notice the product of odd terms is in the numerator now. Two times four, all the way up to two n minus two in the denominator. So the even terms are in the denominator. And then we have to include a pi over two in this case. Then this is also a variant of the well-known Wallace product. So this product equals the square root of pi over two, just like its companion before. And we've established this last tool. Now we're ready to put all of these tools together and finish it off. So we'll start with our inequality. So we have one minus x squared is less than or equal to e to the minus x squared, which is less than or equal to one over one plus x squared. Next, we'll multiply all parts of this inequality by the square root of n. And then we'll also raise all parts of this inequality to the nth power, where n is a natural number. So that'll give us the square root of n times one minus x squared to the n is less than or equal to the square root of n times e to the minus n times x squared is less than or equal to the square root of n times one over one plus x squared to the n. Now we're gonna do a couple of things. We're gonna integrate this from zero to infinity. We're gonna integrate this from zero to infinity. And then instead of integrating this from zero to infinity, we're gonna integrate it from zero to one. So notice since we integrate it from zero to one, we're going to end up with something that's most definitely smaller than what we have here. Okay, so let's see that happen. That gives us the square root of n times the integral from zero to one of one minus x squared to the n dx is less than or equal to the square root of n times the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus n times x squared dx, which is less than or equal to the square root of n integral from zero to infinity of one over one plus x squared to the n dx. Now next, we can use our first tool to take this inside part of the inequality and replace it with the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus x squared dx. And then we can use our last two tools and the limit as n goes to infinity of the outer parts of this inequality to replace those with the square root of pi over two. So let's see what we've done. We've pinned our goal integral between root pi over two and root pi over two, which means it must be equal to root pi over two. And that's a good place to stop.